All right, everybody, welcome to Thursday. The week is almost done, a short week for a lot of you, but we have a great interview for you today. I'm going to be saying that a lot over the next couple of weeks, but I mean it every time. Today, we have Sophia Amoroso of Nasty Gal and Girl Boss fame. She joined Jason, not me, to talk about raising her first venture fund, which she's calling Trust Fund, breaking into the venture capital industry as an outsider with a unique skill set and her approach to branding and design, much more as well. It's a fascinating conversation, a great interview. It's going to be a great show. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Linode. Apply to Linode's RISE program for founder-led early stage startups and get a $500 credit up to $120,000 in infrastructure credits in year one, cloud consulting, and so much more. Apply at linode.com slash twist. Lemon.io, need to speed up your product development without draining your budget? Hire vetted engineers from Europe at Lemon.io. Go to Lemon.io slash twist to get 15% off for the first four weeks. And Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. Try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days and get 20% off an annual subscription at Brilliant.org slash twist. All right. Sophia Amoroso is here. She is a serial entrepreneur, content creator, author, and now she is raising her first fund called Trust Fund. Get it? Trust Fund. You're so good at branding. Thank you. Trustfund.vc if you want to check it out. Second time on the program. Last time was four years ago, 2019, episode 962, if you want to go back. For those of you who don't know, she founded Nasty Gal, the uh, clothing retailer, and uh, she wrote an amazing memoir girl boss that was made into a tv show and uh she did some girl boss rallies then you did what was the um uh, what was your school oh first class business, oh, business class. class sorry business, business class. space class yes yeah, sorry so still doing business class still doing business class and uh now she's raising her front welcome back to the program sophia thank Amorosa. you hi jason hello hi hey, everybody so how's you decided you wanted to start investing in other people's company. Had you done mm-hmm. some angel investing before raising this fund? Yeah. So I've invested over a million dollars of my own money into over 20 startups, including Kind Body and Public and Pipe and Liquid Death early, and realized how much I really love doing it and how much I just love working with founders. And so that's why I started Business Class, which is my online program for entrepreneurs. It's a course in a community. And at a certain point, it was like, okay, I think I'm actually pretty good at this investing thing. Angel investing is different than running a fund. So I absolutely have a lot to learn on that front, but realized I'm sitting on this arsenal of assets that I didn't really realize until I was like, wait, I have great deal flow. I can have a a material impact on the outcome of these early stage companies and help these founders see around corners that sadly, nobody showed me around while I was building my first company. And I have access to amazing LPs and people to send, you know, deal flow my way and also to be helpful to the portfolio founders. So it was like, you know, when I'm done starting businesses, I'm a zero to one founder. Now I get to work from zero to one over and over and over again, and not be the person that has to manage the team of 20 and hopefully 40 and hopefully 100 as these companies grow. But I've seen it and I've tried it and I know I can help. I just don't want to do it again. I hear that over and over again from founders. There is a group of folks who love that zero to one. Hey, I have an idea and now it's manifested. It's in the world. But boy, the uh, going from 100 employees and a couple of million in revenue to a billion in revenue, it's a lot of repetitive stuff. It's not for everybody. So it's good that you figure that out. Yeah. 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 It's a different job. It is a different job. I find it's like repeating yourself over and over again, and then refining the same 20 things. Mm -hmm. Messaging. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your job in the beginning is like you're doing everything and then you know how to do everything. You train people how to do everything and then you bring people in and they're like, here's how you need to do everything. And the people who've been doing it are like, hey, we have our way to do it. (laughs) And there's like, new leadership that's like, no, this is how you do it. And it's, you know, it's just your job becomes managing timelines and inspiring people and hiring and managing their expectations and building culture, which is also really fun. But it's not, it's 
not the job that you sign up for that you think you're going to have when you uh, start a company and think it's going to give you a bunch of freedom because that's not necessarily the case. I have a friend who referred to it as like, you have to do your chores. <laughs> so everybody loves the creation part. Everybody mm -hmm. loves ideas and trying to turn them into a product. And then there are the chores and you must do your chores, hiring, firing, culture, accounting, legal, scaling, open up this office, whatever it is. It's just, it never ends. And, uh, you know, some people love it. There are operate and there, God, God bless them. There's operations people out there who can't get enough of that yeah. stage of a company. Yeah. Yeah. So you're raising the fund publicly. Yeah. Like I am. I'm raising my fourth fund publicly. I'm curious. How did you find out about the concept of raising publicly? Why did you choose that? Yeah. I don't remember how I heard about it. I know Ryan Hoover did it and he's a good friend of mine. So Ryan found a product hunt. He's now um, has a fund called Weekend Fund and they did their most recent raise as a 506C or he called it a community raise. So I just used the same term. And it's something that allows you to raise in public. So typically, when you're raising a fund, you can't talk about it. The SEC won't let you. Um, you can only have 99 LPs with uh, a 506C, or maybe that's a separate thing. There's like a parallel fund. There's a bunch of like acronyms for different things. But essentially, you can raise in public, you can talk about it. And it means that anybody, if you want, can apply. You can use it as a way to, you know, amplify the fact that you're fundraising and get million dollar checks or $5 million checks. But you can also use it like I did to say, hey, I want to give access to people. I didn't have a trust fund. So let's make a trust fund. Yeah. <laughs> and I shouldn't be here. And I don't have the pedigree that people who have my access or experience uh, typically do. How can I bring people who could be accretive to the fund, who could be helpful to portfolio founders, who can bring deal flow to me, who can help amplify the products and the companies who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity? So a few weeks ago in January, I um, announced in TechCrunch that I was doing uh, that I was raising in public and made a website in Webflow, which I'm like learning and I really love. And I made a type form and I made an application. And I said, hey, we're allocating up to a million dollars for people to apply. Tell us why you can be helpful. Tell us about you. Where are you? You know, tag the different categories where you could contribute. Tell us about your experience. And would you write, like to write a check between 2 and 20K? Um, so I allowed people to apply to write checks between 2 and 20K, which in this world is very, very, very small. Yeah, that doesn't exist, yeah. For a $5 million fund. And we got... In a few weeks, not a million in applications, but six point one million dollars in applications for Fantastic. texts between two and twenty k. So it was like over eight hundred accredited investors, people who were self-identifying, you know, qualified because they can yeah. only they have to be accredited investors. And so we've taken the fund from five to ten. Um, Fantastic! I've, I know it's really exciting and have a list of amazing LPs like Mark Andreessen and Chris Dixon and you, Jason, Andrew yeah. Chen, um, Rob Hayes, Paris Hilton. I don't know. It goes on. It's Evelyn's. It's a great, it's amazing. So feeling like I have wind at my back, which is a great feeling. Has it always felt like that? I'm sure we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. But, well, um, I mean, in any career, there's headwinds and yeah, oh yeah you're, tailwinds. you're a bit of a, a very public person. So that's why you should do 506C. I, I chose to do it in this fourth one because I was like, well, I have a podcast or two and uh, I have a Twitter following like you and why not democratize venture capital, give more people access to it. And um, yeah, I did a couple of webinars. I didn't do any press. I should have done mm -hmm. that. And I, maybe I should. Um, and I'm taking a year to do it. I'm like, you know what? This whole idea of like high pressure going on the road, pitching people really hard. I'm kind of over it at mm -hmm. this point in my career. The first one was 10. The next one was 11. The third fund was 44. And the fourth one, uh, we had 52 million in demand already. The problem wow. is there are some caps uh, on accredited investors. You can only have 250 up to 10 million. Then on qualified, mm -hmm. you can have 2,000 people. And I think it's, it's I don't know what the number is, but it's pretty high. So I, I did a very similar thing to you. I just talked about it publicly, talked about it on the podcast. And I should have done the thing where I said, how can you be helpful? But I filled up while the accredited. And that's what you'll experience, I believe, is 
once you have yeah. a track record, which you'll have quickly after this first one, um, or I should say, you'll, you'll have it in three to five years after this one. So let's talk about, we'll assume you hit 10 million. Uh, and if people are interested in something like this, once again, the URL in Webflow, which is a cool product. Yeah, I know a lot of people mm -hmm. using it. Trustfund.vc. Uh, you're great at design, by the way. Thank you. I think yeah. like your zone of excellence Thanks. is just design and branding. As somebody who is into branding Thank and you. design, Thanks. I'm just in awe of your ability to make it's great brands. So fun. I think I just make things so I have an excuse. I start businesses and do things so I have an excuse to name them. <laughs> or I just name them and I'm like, what should this be? And like, will it into existence? No, I'm a lot more, Take I'm a lot more deliberate than that. I'm kidding. Sometimes we get a partner here that has an offer that's so amazing. I barely need to read you the ad copy. I just read you the benefits. Linode has a startup program. It's called Rise, R-I-S-E, and it offers more than just free credits. Startups get up to $10,000 per month in year one credits, followed by a 50% and 25% discount in each of the next two years. And there are no caps and you get a lifetime discount based on your usage. And you get free 24-7, 365 award-winning customer support by the phone, email, or social media. There are no tiers, there are no handoffs, and you get cloud consulting experts to ensure your tech stack scales seamlessly. Plus, Community Connect with other program members, alumni, advisors, and more. And shout out to our friends at Linode, which was acquired by Akamai last year. Congratulations to the team. With Akamai plus Linode, you also get access to leading security and CDN solutions. So you're going to be snappy, snappy all around the globe. If you're cost sensitive, but you want amazing hosting, the solution for you is Linode. That's the answer, right? You want to watch that bill. You want to watch that bottom line, but you also want top tier service and speed. So visit Linode.com slash twist and you will get $500 in free credits and you can apply for their startup program Rise. Rise members receive up to $120,000 in free infrastructure credits during their first year and up to 50% off in the years after that. Take us through the creative process of business class and trust yeah. fund because they're both Ooh. funds. Mm -hmm. uh, and then before that, Nasty Gal and Girl Boss. Uh, these four brands are just all spectacular. So take us through your creative process in branding or coming up with a name. What do you wow, do? Yeah. Smoke a joint and uh, get a whiteboard no, out or I have don't... a glass of champagne and Weed what do you makes do? Me, weed makes me kind of weird. I don't know. I can't do I can't follow kind of makes conversations. Dumb, right? <laughs> makes me a little dumb. It makes me yeah. slow. And I think I'm that's kind of what it's known for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. The learning curve is high. Um, yeah. So Nasty Gal, I was like, okay, what do I name it? I almost named it I Heart Vintage, which was like, oh God, it mm. would have just been so, mm, yeah, I know. Cringe. It's not even my, I was like, oh, it's memorable. I think I can get the name or something like that. It's, it, yeah. But then I was like, okay, there's all these girls selling hippie stuff on eBay and I want to do something different. And my spirit is not hippie dippy. My spirit is like, I don't know. I, the word edgy also feels kind of dated, but there was this, I worked in record stores and was really into music and music was the thing that like, I wasn't, I, I played bass in high school, but I just loved like collecting records and downloading stuff and these weird private servers that record nerds had and would like rip stuff off of vinyl that wasn't you know, re-released re on CD yet. and was just like, it's what I loved. And this, and I remember when this album was re-released, it's called Nasty Gal by a woman named Betty Davis. And Betty Davis was married to Miles Davis for a little while. And she was allegedly like too wild for him. And her music is... <laughs> That's saying something. Yeah, her music is so good. And she was so stylish. And I just absolutely loved it. Um, so I was like, I'll name it Nasty Gal. And I didn't think it was a word I'd be saying for the rest of my life, right? It was an eBay store. I wasn't like, Yes, I'm going to go out, uh, you know, I'm going to somehow get on this week in startups. I'm going to, I didn't know what TechCrunch was. I don't know what investors were. It was just, it was like an eBay store. And it cut through the noise, you know, the first website. So it was nastygalvintage.com. When I had to buy nastygal.com, you can imagine what kind of website I had to buy it from, which was like yeah, it might entertaining. Have been adult in nature, yeah. Never owned nastygirl.com. Haven't been there in a while, but there were definitely like, girls who were like 20 years old being like grandma look at this dress and typing the url in wrong Ooh. there was like upset parents ah. looking at their credit card statements being like what is this yeah. which is like if you have your parents credit card i don't feel bad for you i'm sorry um, uh, <laughs> it's hilarious 
Uh, and, and then, then Girl Boss. Where did where did Girl that Boss, was the origin of that one? Another dank reference. So Girl Boss, uh, I took from the name of a film called Girl Boss Gorilla, G U E R R I L L A, from the seventies, which is a very little known. A female Japanese revenge film of a genre called pinky violence, which um, Tarantino has taken a lot of inspiration from, Mm. um, admittedly. And they're just, again, super stylish, really fun. It's like these super cool Japanese girls like knife fighting in the street. Yeah. There it is. It's so good, right? So I was like, girl boss. Girl boss. Yeah, girl boss. There it is. Yeah. So that's where I was just like, cool, I'm gonna call it girl boss. So that's that's interesting. The genre films that Tarantino is obsessed with. I just read or I listened to, I should say, his audiobook, Cinema Speculation. Did you get it yet? Or no, but I heard it's so good. It's great. And then I started watching some of the films and I'm like, these films are uh, what they would call a genre film, right? Like mm-hmm. horror, revenge, yeah. female revenge, Campy. whatever. Yeah. And um, they're not exactly for me. Mm-hmm. I like thrillers. I like mm-hmm. mysteries. I like a little more going on there, sci-fi. Uh, but I get why he likes it because they're, they have a certain, as the word says, genre films, they, they have a certain purpose, which is to excite you and delight you and, make you uncomfortable yeah. in the theater and that i highly recommend this book but yeah that's interesting um yeah um, mining old media from the 70s to find interesting yeah. words it's yeah, spectacular. Strange. and then business class i was like oh my god naming of entrepreneurship course so difficult so it's like oh do i call it founder academy do i there's just the common all the combinations of words like academy university yeah. You know, the circle, the club, they would be and they're so generic. Descriptive yes. is good because you don't want for something like that. You do want it to sound relatively straightforward. Like you want the title to kind of tell you what it is instead of be like, you know, illumination. I'm just looking at this like coffee cup, intelligentsia, illuminating coffee. But like, you know, that's no one's going to know. Coffee, it's not your, I will say it's great coffee. Mine's super cold, but I'm just sitting here camping. Wait, out my well, desk intelligentsia today. has a great logo as well. We, we named ours Founder University, and it's it's problematic because people keep calling their own things Founder University, and I'm like, hey, uh, that's our trademark. Yeah, but, try okay, real boss. Um, Oof, can't yeah. trademark that. But um, I was on a walk and was with my ex, and I was just like, okay, I was just stringing together words. I'll just do that. I'll sh- just shoot shoot. The and I was like, business business class. And my like, God, that sounds so basic. And then I was like business class and i was Get like it. Ooh. and then i was just you know started putting pinterest boards together of like old pan am kind of ads and um just like all the you know uniforms and fun puns and references so in business class you know, there's modules and there's lessons in a course and the modules are called flights there are seven flights Uh, Over the course of a cohort that lasts 10 weeks, people get lifetime access to the whole program. But it's really it's it's self-led. But we also drop one flight a week so that people are Mm -hmm. kind of taking consuming that content together and not overwhelmed within those flights. The lessons are called legs. And over those 10 weeks, because there's only seven flights, there's three layovers, which are catch up weeks. It's just like Mm. endless. It's just like endless Endless puns, puns, endless things to build. Well, I mean, that's the the most fun when when you strike a theme. And I remember seeing it and I was like, oh, she's doing a business class. And then you always do photo shoots uh, of yourself and, you know, great logos and everything. And I saw you doing it on uh, Instagram or something. And I was like, ah, yeah, pull it up. It's businessclass.co to my producer. I don't know where the trust fund came from, but in business class, I go through naming and and branding and Mm -hmm. visuals and, you know, finance and legal, all everything. But I do take people through, well, obviously, like the thesaurus. So anything you think it is, like, what's just one degree away? What's the kind of like asymmetric Mm. um, reference that isn't the thing that you're necessarily talking about? You don't have Mm. to be super on the nose about it. And then just because I love rhymes and puns, I go to rhymedictionary.com. Oh, so great. And I'll just like jam out on like, okay, here's one thesaurus word. And then how can I turn that thesaurus word into like something that rhymes with that? And it can be a, what's that called when you put two words together? 
There's um, puns. Alliteration. It's a mm, portmanteau. I don't know. It sounds oh. fancy. It's when you combine two words to make a new word. Portmanteau. Yes, I've heard this. Something like that. I didn't know that when I was doing it. Someone told me that recently. So, uh, but it um, sounds fancy. Alliteration is when you have two of the like, same letter to be in sound yeah letter or sound yeah. kim right. kardashian Ooh, there's, yes there are better ones there are better. there are there are better ones but that's Probably that's a like, fine one as well yes uh yeah portamento is uh when you blend words together right yeah to make like a new one so what would an example of that be like uh yeah uh normcore i don't know oh don't yeah know. no there's um there are some of those words now that I, I, I listen to a podcast um, called Red Scare, and they are into this kind of normie culture or whatever, and they use all these hip words and stuff like that. Okay, imagine this. You got an idea for a great tech startup, and you think it's going to change the world, but you got a problem. You just don't have the engineers that you need to make it come true. Why? Well, it's obvious. It's hard to find engineers. There's a lot of competition. And hey, you're trying to keep your burn rate low. You need to conserve cash. Now, imagine you had a partner who could provide you with more than 1,000 on-demand developers, right? As many as you need. And these developers were all vetted, experienced, result-oriented, and they were incredibly passionate about helping you grow your startup. And what if they charged, you know, competitive rates, things that you could afford? Does it sound too good to be true? Well, let me introduce you to Lemon.io. Startup shoes, Lemon.io, because they only offer hand-picked developers with three or more years of experience and who have strong portfolios. In fact, only 1% of candidates who apply to work with Lemon.io get in. A couple of our launch founders have worked with Lemon.io and they had an amazing experience. And listen, I have used outsourced full-time teams for decades, whether it was way back at Weblogs Inc., Mahalo, onto inside.com, at launch, this is the way to do it. Go to lemon.io slash twist and find your perfect developer or tech team. And you can do that in 48 hours or less. And twist listeners get 15% off for the first four weeks. Stop burning money, hire developer smarter, visit lemon.io slash twist. So how, who, what stage are you going after with the fund? Yeah. And then what stage? And are mm -hmm. you vertical specific? Because I think people would say, oh, Sophia Morosa, girl boss, nasty gal, this, that, the other thing. She's going to do content and she's going to do fashion. And is that true or not? Completely untrue. None there of the go. above. Uh, I tried to build a billion dollar direct to consumer fashion business. It's really hard. I've watched my friends try to build billion dollar uh, direct to consumer businesses. And while some of them may be valued at a billion dollars, it's doubtful whether or not any exit will ever happen remotely near that price. And doing a billion dollars in revenue is like a whole nother question. So I put enough stuff in landfills. I don't want to do stuff. Liquid Death was a great investment, but in general, like stuff is not interesting to me. Consumer and kind of the consumerization of enterprise or B2B is really interesting to me. Uh, so that's one area I like to invest in. It's seed and, and seed uh, pre-seed and maybe seed plus whatever. I'm not investing in anybody's bridge rounds from, you know, having raised their seed a year ago. These yeah. are like new companies um, that are just starting now because it's going to be a great vintage because valuations are very much in line with, I think, where they should be. And the word profitability is finally in the mix. And I bootstrapped my first business with no investors or debt to 12 million in revenue. So I get what that means. Um, but I'm also investing in companies that I think can become billion dollar businesses um, and are tech enabled. So they don't have to be purely technology companies. It could be as far as products go, probably the only thing I would invest in that's a physical product might be something like a wearable. Mm. So my investments will be across like B2B and the consumerization of enterprise. So workplace products, um, largely stuff that entrepreneurs can use because I was the C when I started on eBay. eBay was a B2B business. It was a marketplace. Nobody knew was using that term. It was the average person starting a business. eBay gave me this framework that said, here, fill in these blanks and you have a business. And that was a very new thing. Would I have mm -hmm. become an entrepreneur or opened my own 
vintage store on what hate street no like no one would have given me the money but i was able to cobble together my skills and you know my computer and a little digital camera and buy some vintage from vintage stores and there it was i had a business so today the people using the shopify's of the world or the calendly's of the world the calendly user could be someone who is uh an eyebrow like a brow artist who does people's brows but she's also a business person but she doesn't know what sas is calendly's sas shopify sas like every person that read girl boss the 500 thousand people who bought it and this entire generation if they're not entrepreneurs they're entrepreneurial mm. and they're probably using b2b tools even if it's a sorority using slack for something right so people are hacking these what would at one point have been considered enterprise tools for their personal use they're using communities that were meant for individuals for professional use um and what was the b2b i think is the C to B, I guess, in that these are brands that people are that are getting into the these products that are supporting entrepreneurs or the business of one are ones that are attractive because they're also great brands and they're something you want to align yourself with and they're great tools. Like Webflow is cool. Like I'm like I want to say I use Webflow. I want to say I use Notion. And someone who's not necessarily running a business can use Notion, but for the most part, it's marketed as like a, as a B2B tool. And, and this is a great yeah. observation. If yeah. you think about it, you just said raising your fund. You, you talked about Nasty Gal and how you did that with the tools. And you look at raising your fund. You're using, I believe, AngelList's platform, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which has made it like that abstracts 90% of fundraising, Typeform, Webflow, mm -hmm. the press. And your social media following, right? And then when you did, you know, uh, business class, I'm sure you use some collection of technologies and printing and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I don't want to reinvent the together. wheel. Never, ever again. Yeah. H have you thought about your, uh, how many portfolio construction? Let's talk about portfolio mm -hmm. construction and then follow on funding. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of the lessons I learned with the $10 million fund. I think 10 million is the perfect solo GP number. Okay. Uh, it's constrained. And have you thought about how many names you're going to put in there and the average check size? We know you're going for the C yeah. stage. Great. Maybe Series A sometimes. And you're going for tech enabling tools. You're not going for fashion or whatever people might pigeonhole mm -hmm. you into because of your previous success. Got it. Check, check. What is the check size going to be? How many mm -hmm. names? And then follow mm -hmm. on funding because that must have come up a bunch when you were doing the fundraising. Totally. Yeah. People ask all these questions. And I guess. I just want to clarify because I mentioned wearables and that has nothing to do with entrepreneurship, healthcare and fintech money, faster, more accessible, more convenient, more beautifully designed in an, in a new way. Doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, but fintech and health, digital health are also two areas that I find myself really attracted to. So businesses that make people's lives better just through technology, um, yeah. entrepreneurs and individuals. So it's a $10 million fund. We'll write 150k checks into probably 60 or 70 companies, and I'm not planning on having any reserves. I may do follow-ons through SPVs. Never done an SPV before, but I expect to offer those SPVs to my LP base. And yeah, so that's something that they'll have the opportunity to invest in along with me if those companies, when those companies go raise subsequent rounds. It's a nice but way to do it. Zero, like, that's how I did it in the yeah. early days was just, hey, there's a round coming up. Does anybody want to participate? LPs go first. It yeah. works. Um, it becomes a lot of paperwork and a lot to manage. So the funds yeah. might be a more efficient way to do it uh, mm -hmm. in terms of operations. You really need to have a lot of operational people when you start getting into SPVs is what I've mm -hmm. learned after 260 of them. Sounds like a nightmare. Do you use AngelList? Uh, we started on Angels. I was the first one, famously, and the first one we ever did was com.com. So I think that's the most successful oh, one ever wow. done to date. Cool. I put in 50K, I think, from our fund and 328,000 from the syndicate. Uh, again, it was a $10 million fund. We were making 50K bets. Um, and a meditation app seemed like a crazy, stupid bet at the time. People criticized me pretty hard. Um, and it's a $2 billion company. So that worked out. We own 5% of it. So I think it's the most successful syndicate ever done. Um, wow. certainly on AngelList. Um, wow. I don't know if there's other ones, but on in terms of a multiple, it's probably the most successful ever done. Um, and then we did a shore, but a shore fund management went out of business. 
And so I just hired the top three people from ashore in the mm-hmm. tax department and I created SPV solutions, my own SPV company. Cool. Because none of the ones out there I think are going to be long for the universe. Mm-hmm. With the exception of AngelList and Carta, I think that's the yeah. but those are super yeah. expensive. Carta's forty thousand dollars, I think, to maintain an SPV for ten years. Oh wow. which kinda that makes would be it a big super, SPV, yeah. Super expensive, yeah. Uh so then no follow on reserves got it. Sixty names. Talk to me about how you're gonna process all this deal flow because you're mm-hmm. kind of legendary. You're going to get a lot of inbound. Yeah. How are you dealing with that? And from what I know of you, are you an introvert or an extrovert? I'm very much an introvert, but I'm also yes. really curious. So I love meeting people. I mean, I've been on like a full listening tour for the last year before I even decided to raise a fund because I know what comes on the other side of doing something successfully. And okay, this is going to be a 10. Now it's real. I've heard from enough solo GPs and, you know, people like, okay, fundraising is a slog. It's not as fun as just having convic- conviction and writing a check into a founder you like. You know, it's, it's very different. Um, I have a lot of deal thr- flow just through the website, which is interesting. So yeah, trustfund.vc. Um, and then stuff from other folks like founders that I've invested in in the past, um, people I've met over the years. Uh, some of my LPs, other GPs and in, in big funds, you know, you've sent me deals. Sometimes I get invited to SPVs and I'm like, hi, can you make a direct intro? Um, I've yeah. also just gone cold to people and, you know, for kind body, when I invested, I went just to their DMs and I was like, hi, can I talk to the founder? So people will just get on the phone with me. It's if I need to, if I want to source something, it's not hard. That's such a huge advantage that I have. It is a huge advantage. It's a huge yeah, I think advantage. It's a big- you're underestimating yeah. um, deal flow, I believe proprietary deal flow is the name of the game. And so what's great is having sold 500,000 books and you know, you're following, mm-hmm. you're just going to get deal flow other people aren't. And then the second thing is, in deals that are of high quality, the founder wanting you on the cap table is a major thing. So you, you have both of those things going for you. So yeah. I've never I think not it's gonna gotten be- allocation. But again, 20 checks, this will be very different. And my checks are small and the check size. And I'm sure, I mean, maybe you thought about this when your fund's much larger now. And so I don't, I'm curious what size checks you're writing. But what was easy for me was getting as an angel, okay, 25, 50, 100, 150K allocations, where I had to go raise a first time fund and be, you know, have all the glory and be like, I'm going to raise a $50 million fund. It's my next move. I'm the girl boss. Like, that's not what yeah. I'm going for. Like, I want to do a really good job. And there's enough of a learning curve with managing a fund and managing the deal flow. But also, when you have a much larger fund, you're fighting for allocation. So if I was trying to lead seed rounds and put in million, $2 million checks, all my friends that are sending me these great deals, they may be people who are trying to write million and $2 million checks. Yeah, and now it gets your competitive. Elbows, you're bumping into yeah, each other. Yeah, so that Sharp part was just like out. a really easy layup for me to be like, okay, this is already happening and working at this size. Let me just keep doing that and, you know, formalize it beyond angel investing. And in terms of managing the deal flow, I actually hired someone. I have like my fees, you know, it's a small fund, but I found are someone amazing. Are you charging amazing. a 2 and 20 kind of situation? I'm charging 2 and 20, yeah. Um, so for people and, who don't know, 20% yeah. uh, carry, 2% fees a year, basically 10% fees uh, or 20% over the life of the fund or something. It probably tails off. There might be an upper cap, but mm-hmm. that's only 200K a year. Yeah. And that's it's like nothing. travel, entertaining, taking a founder to dinner who you may or may not invest in. It's like everything. It's yeah. nothing. This is the challenge. Yeah. You have to have a, when I did the first fund, the first two funds, I think I had no fees. Third fund, I finally put fees on. And I paid for all my team out of the podcast revenue I have. Mm-hmm. Um, and just starting to change that a little bit as I yeah. go into the, the yeah. last two funds. So I just found someone who's been living in pitch book and uh, at somewhere Fantastic. else and worked for a friend of mine. Um, do you know James Vincent? He founded Media Arts Lab and then and now does I've this. I've heard of him, yeah. A strategy firm called Founder. They also have a venture fund. So, like a researcher, an analyst, associate. Yeah, she's been working for him for the last six years. And um, okay, great. Yeah, so she was on her way out anyway, and you know, came to me, a known entity. And so, people I don't know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, and and also with deal flow, like I'm looking for really high quality stuff. As much you know, as much as it's like cute that I was a community college dropout, and yes, I'm giving access to people who 
maybe don't have like the pedigree of the typical person who would, you know, invest in a fund or be invested in as a founder. Like I've already un- over indexed on the like community college dropout side. Like I'm for the first time in mm. my career, I'm going to be a little bit of a follower because again, I have mm. a lot to learn and I don't need to be finding like the diamonds in the rough. I'm going to be investing alongside top tier firms who can see the landscape because I'm, if I'm looking at a fintech product, I'm going to see some of them. I guess I have great deal flow. I'm not going to see all of them. Mm. They're going to see all of them. And I can be like, this is so cool. Check this out. And if I send it to any of these guys, chances are they're going to be like, yeah, we saw 10 things like that. This is why we passed. And then like, oh, cool. I have an opportunity to learn rather than be like, I'm excited about this thing. You know, they've got a partnership that sees the full landscape. They're also doing diligence on the founders and on the on the companies and they're possibly taking board seats. And that's just like a, a much safer bet for me. And with money, yeah. I want to make safe bets. And well, with the $10 million yeah. funds, investing in that many names, if you do wind up doing 40, 50, 60 names, given the staff size, you're also not going to have the ability to do deep due diligence, you're not going to have the ability to do governance, you don't have, you know, three managing directors to put on or two managing directors to put on boards to represent you. So, you know, it's, it's, I think the approach you're taking is perfect. Um, learn, deploy five, 10 million, 15, whatever you get to, and um, learn. The only thing I would edit in it would be to save 1 million for reserves. Um, okay. And, you know, maybe do five less investments. Because I do think when you hit 30 or 40, you have enough uh, diversification that you'll hit a winner. Mm -hmm. And the thing I'm trying to learn, because I have 350 investments over 12 years, is how do you find out which ones are the winners and then get more money into them before other people figure out their winners and take all that opportunity? Mm -hmm. Because, man, the the ability to invest in the series A, B, and C of Uber or Robinhood or any of these, which I didn't, because that was one and done, um, you know, that was the big challenge for me. And now we've kind of fixed that. Where, and I think that's what most fund managers do if they enjoy being a yeah. fund manager, which you'll find out in the next 24 months. <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast, you clearly have an interest in startups and technology, but do you have the skills and knowledge you need for a career in tech? And if you do have those skills, are you still learning and growing? Because everyone in tech knows if you're not building new skills geared towards the latest platforms, well, you're falling behind. And right now, that platform is AI, artificial intelligence. AI isn't just the future, it's the present. We see that happening. We're talking about it every day on this podcast. And to be part of the tech revolution, you need to understand the core concepts behind AI, you know, things like neural networks, machine learning, these are complex terms, you can guess what they are. But why not go learn about these concepts at brilliant.org. Or this website helps users learn math, science and computer science interactively. And right now, they feature some amazing courses geared towards AI, like an introduction to neural networks, 15 lessons in that one, and search engines, which includes 20 lessons on the core idea behind search engine technology. So here's your call to action. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days by heading to brilliant.org slash twist to start your free trial. And for a limited time, only twist listeners will get 20% off an annual subscription. I'm an investor in the company. It's a brilliant company. And uh, I really want you to try it for you and your company for kids, college, everybody in between everybody should get smarter. Let's all get brilliant together brilliant.org slash twist for 20% off today. Do you um, do you ask for pro rata rights? Um, 100% we will not do a deal do. without them. Wow. Cool. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't I would advise you to not do that either. Um, yeah. And they'll say Oh, well, I'll just be a handshake agreement. Um, mm -hmm. previously known as the gentleman's agreement, uh, mm -hmm. the handshake agreement, you don't want to do, you want them to do a side letter and say, listen, I'm Sophia Amorosa. I can help you with tweets. I can help you with introductions. I need pro rata. My LPs, I told them I get it. Um, mm -hmm. and then almost universally, they'll do it for you. Ooh, I told my LPs. I love that. I can blame my boss. Oh, basically. That's so cool. And, and in my case, it happens to be the truth. Yeah. And yeah. here's the next card that'll happen. The founder will give you pro rata, a series A will occur, the term sheet comes in, they're like, Oh, this big venture capital firm says they'll put in 5 million at 20 million post. Um, but everybody has to waive their pro rata. And then so what I do, after this happened to me over and over again, maybe four or five times, I called those VC firms, I said, Hey, listen, do you really want to run me over? 
because mm -hmm. I need to get this pro rata. And they would say, no, 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 of course not, Jake. We, we love you. Yeah. You know, You're like, because I have weight to throw around. Well, and you do too. And, That's, and, the, yeah. and the greatest weight is, um, I will not pass you the ball. And I literally said that to somebody. I said, listen, I'm Chris Paul. I'll bring the ball up the court. I'll pass it to you where you like it. If you don't, if you try to screw me and take my pro rod away, I will ice you out. I will never pass you the ball, which mm -hmm. is what you would do in Brooklyn. If somebody was mm -hmm. a jerk, you just don't mm -hmm. pass them the ball. You pass it to the other people, let them score the ball. People get the point real quick. So you can use that. And then the thing I started doing was I started preparing founders for this. Later stage VCs will try to screw your angels and seed investors. Be prepared for it and understand that I have your back for all time. And if they screw me, there's only one person after me because I'm one of the first investors, it's you. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wa is willing to screw your angels and seed investors, guess what? They're going to screw the founders next mm -hmm. or the team. You know, it's, yeah. it's just the nature of some sharp elbow people in this business. Um, yeah, it's, you have to stand up for yourself and then you have to have information rights as the other thing. So yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I just Do put in our documents. Demand? I say write a monthly update. Uh, okay, in the first yeah. couple of years of the business. And then, you know, when you get your series A, series B, maybe it goes to six times a year or quarterly, but we actually put it in there. We track it. We follow up with them. And if somebody, this is my best advice, month one, I'll have somebody on my team say, hey, we didn't get January's update. Month two, hey, we didn't get February's. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. in March, mm -hmm. hey, we didn't get January, February's. We checked our spam folders. Did it get sent or do we miss it? Um, and uh, how right, about we do a Q1 like with you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I said, how about we do a Q1 and I have them and then they CC me. Yeah. Uh, or they CC, you know, my wags, aka Mike, so, you know, they say, Hey, Mike would love to jump on a call with you or Jason would love to jump on a call with mm -hmm. you. And then we just have a phone call. Yeah. How did the first quarter go? And then I'll just tell you them right up front. I know how this is as a founder. If you're not sending an update, it's either because you're so busy, things are going so well, or there's a lot of problems and you want to fix them before you send the update. Mm -hmm. Am I right? And they're like, yeah, you're right. I'm like, yeah. which is it? They're like the latter. I'm like, okay, yeah. what are the problems? How can we help you fix them? Yeah. And that's the early warning system. But you know what? Nobody does it in our industry anymore, especially not the C investors. They put a bet in and they disappear. There's not. And I think uh, that's, the, that's the problem in the industry right now is all these new GPs, a lot of them have never run a business like you and I have. Therefore, you know, they, they've never hit 10, 20. You, you must have hit 50 million in revenue, much more than oh, I did. No, over 100. Over 100, yeah. And that's the So, yeah. like, you've run a business with 100 million in revenue. Like, you know what you're talking about? Like, that's why they want your money. Yeah, Therefore, that's the thing. It's like, let me be helpful before the <laughs> hits the fan. That's why I'm don't. here. Don't email me telling me your company's falling apart because like that's happened with two of my portfolio companies. Oh, so frustrating. In the you know last few months. And it's, it's, there's, it's a bloodbath. People are overvalued and they can't raise their bridge rounds and they're you know, even down rounds, whatever. It's hard. Um, but you know, don't, don't tell me when it's too, you know, and then I'm like, okay, well, here's, here's, here's someone who might be able to buy it, but like, I'll get wiped out anyway, but I still want to help. Even if I'm going to get wiped out, I want to help. Like I can help. It's harvesting all of the that I've done for the last 16, 17 years for free. It's not like for free, but the founders aren't paying me, right? Like yeah. I'm giving them money. I'm giving them money to harvest my expertise to like, it's, it's, I love it. It's what I love doing yeah. because I don't want to keep learn and of course i'm going to continue learning all the time but there's so much that i can add that i would much rather give to someone else to apply <laughs> to a startup than for me to do after again after you know building companies for so long it's, use um, it like use me like text me text me at 11 p.m just use me ask for things i did something early on where i told founders you know again language matters and then saying something two or three times, like you really care about words, uh, like I do. And I, I came up with just a little phrase, like, and I just said, at some point, everything's going to be a complete, utter disaster. It always is, mm -hmm. especially for the successful companies. And when that happens, you can't tell your employees because they're going to get scared and they're, they're going to quit. Well, that's your fear. Mm -hmm. you can't tell your board because then you're going to get scared and they're going to fire you or try to replace you. I said, just call me. And mm -hmm. just tell me exactly how up it is. And I will tell you 10 stories. I guarantee you that are more effed up than what you told me. And then I can just give you candid advice of how I would approach it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at one point I had somebody call me and he's like, I can't take it anymore. It's a Saturday afternoon. So you just call you. I said, where are you right now? 
I said, I'm in my bathroom. I just threw up in the shower. I'm so anxious. I said, okay, uh, you want to get coffee or something? He's like, I got the kids and my wife waiting in the car. I got to go take everybody to brunch. I said, okay, have the best brunch ever. That's the most important thing. And then meet me for coffee after. Uh, and just tell your wife, your investor needs to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, and you got no choice. Said, okay, great. We talked. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. You know? And I always tell them the same thing. Like, listen, if this company doesn't work out, you shut it down. We all There's take the more loss. Companies. There's more companies. And then start you know? a new one based yeah, on what you learned here. That's I the great that's part of the this. The thing people don't realize is that they're not, of course, you want to, you're going to stick it out as long as you can, but not every idea is going to work out. And sometimes you make mistakes as an operator, or you hire the wrong people, or you're overvalued, or there's macro things happening outside of your control. And like, hopefully we're, we're all going to have multiple lifetimes and we can all be cats that land on our feet after you know, with nine lives, right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of people think that because they attach their identity to something that if that's no longer part of their, you know, who they are, then they're not worth anything or they're a failure. And it's just like, that just comes with the territory. And I haven't learned anything from success. I mean, I've learned from success, but I've learned the most from the challenging times. It's like when, when the tide is high, you're like, oh, cool. Like, there's no like weird crabs shells and, you know, cans and bottles stuck in the mm -hmm. mud. And then the, the, the tide recedes and then you're like, oh, all this crap was happening under the surface in my organization. Like a good metaphor. I had no idea. Yeah. And then you get to see all the crap that was like hiding out under, you know, all of the, you know, celebrations and champagne cliques and, you know, re uh, you know, milestones and accolades that was like it was still there even when your company you know yep. even when business atrophies or um plateaus like that stuff's there all the time and it's a gift to see it because then when you do company number two you know what the what the murky looks like also you, you can, know you start you with the tide low <laughs> you mentioned like you're you become identified with this you were the nasty gal you were the girl boss to an extent that like people wanted this to be your identity and they made a tv show about mm -hmm. you like mm -hmm. talk about how you put those things to bed and yeah just or how you manage it now because listen i had the same thing i was the silicon alley reporter for my first magazine i was mahalo i was in gadget i was this week at startups now i'm all in i was the angel investor in uber yada 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 i mean the, mm -hmm. the public wants to pin you and put you in a box forever Totally. You want to move on and do the next thing. So how, yeah. how, do you, how does Sophia Amorosa handle that? Let me just paint a picture from June yeah. of 2016 to April of 2017. So June of 2016, I'm on the cover of Forbes magazine, uh, named one of America's richest self-made women with a net worth of $280 million, allegedly richer than Beyonce. On paper, like, yeah. you know, my company was worth $350 million. I bootstrapped it. So even after raising 60, I owned 80% of it. So in 80% wow. of, yeah. The first money into Nasty Gal was out of the growth fund. Um, July of 2016, my husband of like less than a year, like bails. And it's like, we've been together for like four or five years. Like, what's going on? What Were you like emotionally? Could you just give me warnings or something? That was really, that was, that sucked and then november of 2016 while i'm standing in front of a thousand people at a conference in australia promoting a book that i was like you have to go on the book tour right like the wheels yep. are you know and i had hired a ceo for nasty gal two years prior so i had a ceo running the business because i didn't like being the ceo because i know my strengths and one of my strengths may not be hiring ceos turns out and it was on the day that Trump became Trump was elected in November of 2016 that I'm on stage in Sydney moments after having had a, had a board call saying, all right, like we have to send this thing into chapter 11 because it was like Hail Mary after Hail Mary after, you know, down rounds being cock blocked by, you know, you could guess who, whatever. Yep. And then April, and then it's just like the girl boss is, a, you know, she's not the girl boss. You know, she oh, ha had to make tough decisions. How dare she, you know, ask people to work hard and toxic culture. And it's like, guess what? I'm like 20 something and I've never even worked in an office. Like the only office I've ever worked in, my name was, ha my name has been on the lease of. Doesn't say that I'm not responsible for having, you know, for anything. Right. 
Yeah. Um, and so that was just all the conflation of who I was as a CEO, the person who wrote this book, you know, this girl millennial is 20 something year old with like an edgy haircut, you know, standing akimbo, looking like she knew what was up, inspired so many people. And then, oh, wow, watch this, like this slow mm. face plant. And then in April of 2017, the Netflix series came out. Mm. So four months after Nasty Gal fell apart, I left, I stepped, I stepped off the board and I was like, cool, I'm 10 years. You know, it was like, it sucked, but it was also at that point, I just was like, I don't know what to do with this thing. It was my entire youth. I was like, kind of ready to move on. Mm. It's hard to quit and it's hard to be fired when you're a founder and you've raised money and it was torture for the last few years. And now there's this scripted comedy. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. It was a Netflix series it was produced by Charlize sure. Theron. It was like amazing talent called, ne- called Girl Boss with a girl who's 22 in San Francisco starting an eBay store called Nasty Gal being streamed into 130 million homes in 195 countries in almost every language. A few months after I have like divorced myself from the thing and the person I was for the first, for the last decade. So now there's this, all this new awareness of this nasty gal and the girl boss and Sophia, her name was Sophia in the show. And it was like, well, who is she really? The character's kind of abrasive. Well, is Sophia really like that? It was just like, the show was the thing that really kind of like, you know, and there's people whose jobs are literally critics for television. Like I've been critiqued, yeah. like I've been put through the ringer, but you know, there were headlines like, um, the worst thing about Netflix's girl boss is its source material. Ooh. Ooh. That's, that's, yeah. Me. That's you. <laughs> so how did I deal with that? I just yeah. kept moving. I'm like, what? I'm not, I don't know. I'm yeah. not going to disappear. Girl boss still has momentum. Like it inspired so many people and it did, so much and i can't tell you how many thousands of dms i've gotten over the years from people who are like i quit my job because of girl boss they finally started my business like it's amazing i wouldn't i didn't know that someone like you or me could start a business because girl boss came out a year after lean in and that was the big new modern book that was written by a woman in business and it was like cheryl sandberg and Susie orman it was just like holy and i threw a wrench in it as a community college dropout and every other probably even college educated girl, but just maybe not Ivy league or, or like MBA girl was like, Oh my God, like I could start an eBay store. I could start an Etsy store. I can start a Shopify business. I can, i if she's confident and she didn't come from a lot, then maybe I should be too. You um, demystified so I, I just kept running yeah. with girl boss yeah. and it was, it was a great, it was a great ride. Yeah. I mean, the what I think of when you tell the story, and it, thank you for sharing it, by the way, I think it's mm-hmm. good to be honest like that, because other founders, mm-hmm. especially ones you're going to invest in can see like, they build you up, they build you up, they build you up. Yeah, the press, the public, the social media, everything. And then, um, yeah, they love they love the face plant, they love when you trip and fall. Um, but I think about our discussion about creating great brands, right? And great names. Mm-hmm. You create this a great name girl mm-hmm, boss and mm-hmm. then it's like oh well that just writes the headlines for the critics mm-hmm. but these critics mean nothing they, they literally mean nothing in the arc of history there have been like three or four critics who actually matter roger ebert was an exceptional thoughtful critic who was a super fan quentin tarantino's book of criticism is actually very thoughtful but almost universally critics don't matter uh and their their life's work is often to take other people down, uh, you know, once in a while, they support something, but most often, they get a real kick out of kicking people, uh, mm-hmm. or laughing when they trip and fall, and they, 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 they risk very little. Mm-hmm. And this uh, is plagiarized from the Anton ego speech at the end of Ratatouille. Have you ever yeah. seen Ratatouille, the Pixar mm-hmm. film? Yeah, it's been a while, but yeah. Watch the, um, an- just type in Anton ego. He's the, he's the food critic. And he does an incredible speech at the end, just about the creators versus the critics. Yeah, it's just like, consider the source. It's someone evaluating you who's never done what you're doing that has no idea what that's like. And it's like, they've never been in the ring. How could they, how could they understand what's that like enough to even criticize you, right? Like, you have to be an expert. Um, 
Well, then gender yeah. plays a huge role in it too, because you were pioneering in the tech industry. And the name of the book is Girl Boss, Nancy Gale. So then gender comes into it and they're like, oh, look at this little lady who oh, wrote yeah. a book. It was like, yeah, totally. Yeah. It was like Natalie Massonet from Natter Porter. I mean, it was it was like Tony Shea from... Z- I started an e-commerce business in 2007, yeah. right? Pre-Glossier, pre-Away, pre-Outdoor Voices, pre-Bumble, amazing, amazing women. I've had, yeah. you know, been really lucky to watch, um, you know, have their own awesome rides, build great companies so it was really weird and lonely and i was kind of heralded heralded as this poster child because there was no one else to point at also i probably sold magazines like i like knew very well like just the the whole kind of the whole kind of thing the um, machine Let's yeah face it. and yeah time. one of the headlines when nasty gal fell apart was does the failure of nasty gal mean that millennials aren't ready to lead and it's like i'm sorry like an entire generation how am i responsible for an entire generation that's wild. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, it's like if I to be and especially with the word girl boss and, you know, maybe we'll talk about that, but you can only hope that the brands you create or the mark that you make is such a part of the zeitgeist that it's representative of whether it's good or bad or becomes warped by culture or ages poorly or, you know, becomes the coolest thing ever and stays the coolest thing ever forever, which pff, nothing really does. Like leaving that kind of a mark and putting something out there that is so ubiquitous, it's like it's a win no matter what. Like it's it's such a fascinating I, thing I'm to so do. I'm so glad to hear you say that, Sophia, because the way I look at it is lean in and girl boss, both of these. Mm-hmm. Can't, and I have three daughters, so I care very deeply about this. It came at a time where people were like, women, tech industry, mm, and both of them, I think, gave permission in different ways. You know, one is more like, I think, you know, what Cheryl was doing was saying, hey, listen, if you're in that board meeting, if you're in that meeting, and you're one of the few women, not forget about being a founder, forget about being the boss, just mm-hmm. you're a woman in the tech business, you know, stand up for yourself, stand up for your thoughts, mm-hmm. you know, own it, lean in and and take responsibility uh, for pushing things, right, is mm-hmm. my interpretation of it. And she was sort of saying, like, she didn't lean in enough, and she wished she had. So she was trying to pass it on. And then for you, uh, quote unquote, nobody like me, you know, not from the Ivy League. It's those people, and this informs a lot of my investing. It's those people who are, you know, outsiders who actually make the biggest impact. Mm-hmm. If you just look at the history of this, we remember Zuck and Bill Gates, uh, you know, dropping out of Harvard because it's so notable and it's, it seems like such a great poetic story. But what you'll find as an angel investor for anybody listening who chooses to do this is it's people who have skills, who want to change the world, who are irritable and unsatisfied and, you know, maybe not the most balanced, but who also (laughs) are obsessed with customers and products to a point that they Mm -hmm. want to change the world. And I think that book and just even the term, Mm -hmm. it gave permission to a lot of people like you were saying, and you get those DMs. And so the critics and all the nonsense does not matter. What matters is the legacy. The legacy is amazing. And it, the legacy, it's just starting. I mean, you're still very young. And this, the big thing that I, I see in our industry is a lack of people with check writing ability um, mm-hmm. who are not white guys from Harvard and Stanford's mm-hmm. business schools. And, yeah. and that's the revolution yeah. right now. I was talking to Molly on This Week in Star Wars about it just the other day of how now it's 16 percent of decision makers once that uh inventor are women mm-hmm. still you know whatever a third of what it should be it's got a triple but it'll get there and i think the way to do it is to start your own fund so it's to give me money well uh, bottom line if you want to see the change in the world i actually yeah, think true. this is important for rich people and i've had this conversation especially not just with women but women of color uh you, there are a lot of people who should they virtue signal all day long on twitter they they put a Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, BLM or, you know, uh, some showing of support mm-hmm. and they're supporting the next thing and the next thing. They don't write the check. Mm-hmm. You got to write the check if you actually want to see the change to happen. It's not enough to just tweet or retweet or like. Take out your checkbook. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked for you, Sophia. I think you're going to be amazing at this. Thank you. Um, and anybody who's a founder, go to trustfund.com. VC. VC slash invest. But speaking of accredited investors, there is a limit. And I have a lot. So QPs call me. 
I am in the QP phase as well. Purchasers call me. I that means you the- have a lot of money. So the people listening who have like yeah. over five million dollars in assets, family offices, high high net worth people email. who can write a hundred k, two hundred fifty k check. Yeah, so this is this is what you need to do next. I in info I at trustfund.vc. Trustfund.vc. Go there if I'm, you're a founder. Go there if you're QP. I'm if you're accredited, there. sign up just so you have them for next time. I did a mm-hmm. yeah. Well, where, where you're going to be on your second and third fund is where I am now on my fourth fund, which is the lottery. So accredited investors, cool. I did three or four webinars. I collected all the interest. I had so much. I said, okay, existing accredited investors go first. Then everybody else is in a lottery. So you have to this date, cool. put your allocation in. Then I did the lottery. People dropped off. They didn't fill the paperwork. No problem. Everybody mm-hmm. else. And then I took the people who are accredited investors. I said, in the launch fund five, since you did four, I will allow you to go first in launch fund five. Or if we do mm-hmm. another lottery, you'll have three ping pong balls to new people's one, let's say. So you have three X the chance of getting in. And I think the future of this is not the big endowments for folks like us. I think this public thing, my thinking is, well, maybe instead of going for 150 million, um, just do 25 or 50 million every 18 months Mm -hmm. and just allow access to people who don't normally have access to this venture class. Yeah, I think that's the revolution. And I know we're probably out of time, and I'm just going to ask your advice on this. Yeah. How long do you plan on deploying this next fund for? I think just the fund cycle is such an interesting thing. Yeah. And so I yeah. it's such a great question. I sat out a lot of 2021 and 2022, 2021 because of the valuations. Mm-hmm. It didn't make sense. People wanted 50 million before they had product market fit or customers or had even launched their product. And I was like, yeah. well, that makes no sense. There's no chance for, I like a 50x. Anytime I make an investment, I want in my mind, to be able to map out a 50x. Okay, we're investing at 10 million. Okay, 50x is 500 million, we might get diluted a little bit. How do I get what, what kind of revenue would this company need to have? And then I do what's called um, a total addressable market, but I do it a bottoms up. So I just with my team have that very thoughtful conversation about entry price. And yeah. to your question about deployment, it is based on market conditions. My belief is in 2023, I'm seeing so many good companies that have you know, five to 50 K a month in revenue, which is my sweet spot. Mm. And they're priced at five to $15 million. And then I see these other companies come out of certain accelerators, I'm not going to dig anybody for getting a great price, but they've built people up, they, they've built up such a frenzy, maybe some accelerators that, you know, raising at 20, 30, 40 million before you have a product in market, mm. not for me, mm-hmm. those companies inevitably come back to market at the same valuation with five customers. So I'm patient. I think the right deployment schedule, according to everybody I talk to, is 30 months. Okay. 24 to 30 months for primary investment, you save a little bit for reserves. That's what I hear. But I think you could do it in 18 to 30 months as well, if you have great opportunities. The most yeah, important like, thing is portfolio construction. Picking do you winners. you have 40 names, yeah. so you have a chance of an outlier. I hit outliers every 25 to 50, and as best as I can tell. Mm-hmm. So, and it'll, I think this is the vintage where it's going to be extraordinary. If you can invest yeah. at 5 million, that's when I invested in Ubercom. Uh, Robinhood was under 20, I think. Like when you invest in those kind of early valuations as a seed investor, and you maybe can put in a second bet and the winners, this mm-hmm. is why I think the one flaw in your game is the follow on. Okay. And so I'm going to keep pushing you on, just save 10% for follow on. Um, Cause what if you hit an Uber? What if you hit a Robinhood? What if you hit a com? You really want to put that 500k check in or 250k check in and be bold that 250k check it might only go 30x whereas your 150 might go 100x but 30x on 500k whoa mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. so it returns the entire fund plus 50 percent. so you and you're going to know it's a winner that's the paradox yeah when so you're my management- investor, you know the pa- you know the winner my management company is called Picking Winners LLC. I've got a, I've got an Amex. It says Picking Winners LLC. That's the goal. Um, That's a good one. I actually bought the domain We Back Builders as a. Cool. I was going to change everybody's email to it. You and I think the same. We always like phrases and words. I buy URLs just for fun. Totally. Me too. Totally. We Back Builders yeah. is the one I bought recently. I yeah. forwarded to myself. Okay, you had another question. Yeah. How I much- like wrapping out with you. You're good. You're yeah, good uh, well, I'm just learning. This is like all I do. I'm just love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, 
That's why I do a podcast. Who better to talk to? I know, right? You get to like learn for an hour. I had Frank Slootman on from Snowflake again. You know, the, you know, Snowflake, the crazy company. This guy, Frank Slootman, have you read his book yet? Amp it up. Mm -mm. Read this book, amp it up. This guy's a maniac. He's like, I call him General Slootman. Incredible. Just like, I don't care what you think of how I run my company. I'm, I'm here to win, not make friends Mm -hmm. kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's just about, building the energy in a company and the pace of a company it's it's awesome and i'll send you the podcast with him it's it's worth listening to this guy's a beast cool what you had one more question go ahead yeah how much of your investment at this stage is in the idea or the founder like five Mm, million sometimes pre-revenue five million valuation is like all right there's some traction but it's still the chance Mm. of that becoming you know an uber is slim so is it the founder is it other people's cosigns it on, used you know, to be founders I, I don't trust anybody else okay. anymore there's too many funds there's too many games going on people are sending you deal flow that are the ones that can't raise money and they invested in the, the winners in their portfolio so they're sending you the negative portfolio because then you get to extend the life of their losers or i should say losers their companies that are destined to not be able to raise money they want you to fund them but they didn't tell you about the ones that they funded and did an inside round on So Mm -hmm. be careful. There's a little gamesmanship going on there. You know, as best as I can tell now, people have decoded what it means to be a founder based on books like yours, mine, Y Combinator, content, podcasts. So people can put on a pretty pretty good show. So your ability to get snowed is pretty high now, right? People Mm -hmm. know how to tell a story, they know how to pitch. All that's been decoded um, and gamed and hacked. So I look at what my eyes tell me. Product velocity, product design customers and team members if you look at those it's kind of you can't fake a team member who's a winner joining a company you can't fake a customer being delighted you can't fake a product that looks gorgeous and is functional and beautiful and so i'm trying to believe from first principles what i can see as opposed to my ability which i think is great or i thought was great to read people because i have in my later years as an investor been snowed so many times now where people, you know, told me some great story and they just, the products never hit 2.0, 3.0. They never advanced. They never hired anybody. And man, they burnt mm-hmm. money like drunken sailors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. anyway, just See one that. theory is that founders have figured out how to snow people like us, yeah. capital allocators. They know I how to put like, on the show. Yeah. How do I know any family offices? <laughs> You know, great question. Uh, There's a database of them. uh, But I think the best thing for you to do is to do what you're doing, do the media tour. And every time you do a media tour, you come on this podcast, go on other podcasts, you're a great podcast guest, you're honest about your time at nasty gal and girl boss, that's super fascinating. So I would just lean in, so to speak. Yeah, into the media thing, which I am giving you the advice I need to take. I don't do media because I have so much stuff going on. But I do need to do some more media. Yeah. Uh, I haven't done one press story about raising this fund, but I should do more. Yeah, um, I did TechCrunch. I'm doing this, but it's, you know, your team reached out to me and I'm so excited to get well, on yeah, here I mean, with I'll you again. The fund and I was like, well, know, Sophia's so a great cool. guest. Thank and you. And you're podcast shy. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to put money into this fund, at least I should get a podcast out of it. I can't afford a publicist, so I'll just like DM no, you don't need some, a publicist. Here's what I'll you need just, to do. Yeah. You have to do it yourself now. You DM somebody who's a podcaster, this is my technique. Mm -hmm. I just tell people when I like something they do. So I just texted uh, or I DM'd uh, Rain Johnson, the guy who did Knives Out. Cool. Yeah. And he's doing this new thing called Poker Face, which is kind of like Columbo, the TV show that I I just love with Natasha Leone. And I just DM'd him and I was like, I'm two episodes in, this is great. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And I'm just sincerely telling him that and like, I think you just yeah. sincerely tell somebody you like their podcast. Yeah. Next thing you know, you'll be on it. Yeah. You're Sophia Amoroso. I'll, like, I'll get a list from guess. you. Thank you. All right. This has been another amazing episode of This Week in Startups. Everybody go to trustfund.vc if you want to get money or if you want to support Sophia's new fund. I'm in it. Mark Andreessen's in it. Paris Hilton's in it. Uh, how much more do you need to know? Paris Hilton's in. You're friends with her. She, yeah, a little bit. Friendly? I'm, I'm, I'm closer with Carter, her husband. They just had a oh. baby. Yeah. Yeah, those they're great. She's kind of a genius. She's really smart. She's very smart. What is her genius? Is it brand? Is it 
I don't know. I think it's like playing in pop culture. I don't know. She made pop culture. She invented that's hot. She invented the first meme. It was like the first reality show. You know, the the simple life. The simple life. Yeah. No, she was like pioneering. Um, and the baby voice is like a like she admitted when I interviewed her on stage at the Girl Boss rally, like, yeah, there's a baby voice. Like that's not really the thing. Oh, really? So that's like uh yeah. interesting she's just smart she's a you know i mean i'd rather her describe you should have her on yeah. i you know you what i on. should i, I went totally to a front air house on. once i had a couple conversations with her she's very uh intelligent she's, she's so very lovely. interested in people and yeah. lovely and yeah. i just think there's something there that is um i don't want to say savant because savant kind of means like you're deficient in other areas yeah no, i think there's I a like- zone of excellence yeah, that's, but I want to use that word savant, but it does mean like, yeah, you're like, it's idiot savant, whatever. But yeah, they, like, people I put the like, idiot automatically. I know. She's a virtuoso, but, is what I would say. There is a zone of excellence where she is unrivaled, which is capturing yeah. attention. Like, even yeah. when they did a fake meme, there's one picture where she's in a club and she's got her arms up like this, and it was just like a blank t shirt, and somebody put on it, stop being poor. And oh my God. It's not I her. Didn't, I didn't know that. I've, I swear I've the seen stop that. The being poor meme is like unbelievable. And she's just like, yeah, that I don't own a t-shirt that says that somebody photoshopped that. My God. But the media. She, yeah, so genius. warped. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll go on a media tour and hope they don't skewer me. I would say like we'll you see. should be on Tim Ferriss, yeah. Lex Friedman. Um, I just did both of those in the past year. They're really smart. Um, you should be in... What will be another? You put it, pull up the uh, picture. You'll see it. You'll you'll recognize oh, this funny. immediately. This is like from the eighties. Uh, yeah. Oh, Ryan Johnson. By the way, it's not Rain Johnson. It's Ryan Johnson. Oh, okay. Yeah, there it is. Stop being poor. Stop being desperate. That's, I, that's my. By the way, when I was so broke, funny. I just yeah. had the picture of that on my desk, and I would just look at it and be like, Jake House, stop being poor. <laughs> yeah. Stop being desperate. Oh, I is like- that the original? It would stop being desperate. And somebody replaced I it with poor. I swear I've seen Stop Being Poor. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Stop Being Poor is the one, yeah. Funny. Uh, but yeah, I would do, I think Lex Friedman would be interesting. He, he's like a, like the ultimate AI interviewer robot. Tim Ferriss is like the soulful OG Yeah, I've been on Tim's, but it's been so long and I don't so long. really. I don't think he has people in, on a second time that often. I haven't but. stayed in touch with him, yeah. Um, 20 Minute VC would be good if you've done that. I know, yeah. I was going to be on it. Harry, actually. Harry's on, nice. On WhatsApp. Yeah. When I sent him my first deck, he made a loom video, like tearing it apart and was like, here's what you need to do. And I was like, this for is him. so cool. That kid's Thank you. amazing. He came yeah, to the intro like five or six years ago. He's like, yeah. no, Jake, I, I just want to let you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your podcast and I'm going to start a podcast that's kind of derivative or like inspired by what you've done. And I don't know if that's true or not, mm-hmm. uh, but would you be a guest? And I'm like, of course I'll be a guest kid, whatever you want. Yeah. And now this yeah. kid's like, you know, I know. doing like 8,000 episodes a year. I'm like. I know, Rock yeah, on, he's, Harry he's, he's nuts, he's so, that guy is always, Prolific. yeah, he like Prolific. writes me back at hours that I know are not normal in London, so I don't know, Yeah, I wonder right. if he sleeps. All right, everybody, great to okay. see you, Sophia, great to catch Thank up, you, and Jason. we'll talk soon. Thank you, Jason, all right, have a good one.